the white wolf of the hearts mountains this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by colby curran the white wolf of the hearts mountains by frederick marriott scarcely had the soldiers performed their task and thrown down their shovels when they commenced an altercation it appeared that this money was to be again the cause of slaughter and bloodshed philip and Kranz determined to sail immediately in one of the paraquas and leave them to settle their disputes as they pleased he asked permission of the soldiers to take from the provisions and water of which there was ample supply a larger proportion than was there to share stating that he and Kranz had a long voyage and would require it and pointing out to them that there were plenty of coconuts for their support the soldiers who thought of nothing but their newly acquired wealth allowed him to do as he pleased and having hastily collected as many coconuts as they could to add to their stock of provisions before noon philip and Kranz had embarked and made sail in the paraqua leaving the soldiers with their knives again drawn and so busy in their angry altercation as to be heedless of their departure there will be the same scene over again i expect observed Kranz, as the vessel parted swiftly from the shore i have little doubt of it observe even now they are at blows and stabs if i were to name that spot it should be the accursed isle would not any other be the same with so much to inflame the passions of men assuredly what a curse is gold and what a blessing replied Kranz. i am sorry pedro is left with them it is their destiny replied philip so let's think no more of them now what do you propose with this vessel small as she is we may sail over these seas in safety and we have i imagine provisions sufficient for more than a month my idea is to turn into the track of the vessels going to the westward and obtain a passage to goya and if we do not meet with any we can at all events proceed up the straits as far as pulu pelong without risk there we may safely remain until a vessel passes i agree with you it is our best nay our only place unless indeed we were to proceed to cochin where junks are always leaving for goya but that would be out of our way and the junks cannot well pass us in the straits without their being seen by us they had no difficulty in steering their course the islands by day and the clear stars by night were their compass it is true that they did not follow the more direct track but they followed the more secure working up the smooth waters and gaining to the northward more than the west many times they were chased by the malay proyas which infested the islands but the swiftness of their little pakora was their security indeed the chase was generally speaking abandoned as soon as the smallness of the vessel was made out by the pirates who expected that little or no booty was to be gained that enemy and philip's mission was the constant theme of their discourse may easily be imagined one morning as they were sailing between the isles with less wind than usual philip observed Kranz, you said that there were events in your own life or connected with it which would corroborate the mysterious tale i confided to you will you now tell me to what you referred certainly replied Kranz. i have often thought of doing so but one circumstance or another was has hitherto prevented me this is however a fitting opportunity prepare therefore to listen to a strange story quite as strange perhaps as your own i take it for granted that you have heard people speak of the hearts mountains observed Kranz. 
I have never heard people speak of them that I can recall, replied Philip, but I have read of them in some book and of the strange things which have occurred there. It is indeed a wild region, rejoined Krantz, and many strange tales are told of it. But strange as they are, I have good reason for believing them to be true. I have told you, Philip, that I fully believe in your communion with the other world, that I credit the history of your father and the lawfulness of your mission, for that we are surrounded, impelled, and worked upon by beings different in their nature from ourselves. I have had full evidence, as you will acknowledge, when I state what has occurred in my own family, why such malevolent beings as I am about to speak of should be permitted to interfere with us and punish, I may say, comparatively unoffending mortals is beyond my comprehension, but that they are so permitted is most certain. The great principle of all evil fulfills his work of evil. Why? then not of the other minor spirits of the same class inquired philip what matters it to us whether we are tried by and have to suffer from the enmity of our fellow mortals or whether we are persecuted by beings more powerful and more malevolent than ourselves we know that we have to work out our salvation and that shall be judged according to our strength if then there be evil spirits who delight to oppress man, there surely must be, as Amin asserts, good spirits whose delight is to do him service. Whether then we have to struggle against our passions only, or whether we have to struggle not only against our passions, but also the dire influence of unseen enemies, we ever struggle with the same odds in our favor as the good are stronger than the evil which we combat. In either case, we are on the vantage ground, whether, as in the first, we fight the good cause single-handed, or as in the second, although opposed, we have the host of heaven ranged on our side. Thus are the scales of the divine justice evenly balanced, and a man is still a free agent, as his own virtuous or vicious propensities must ever decide whether he shall gain or lose the victory. Most true, replied Krantz, and now to my history. My father was not born, or originally a residence in the Hartz Mountains. He was the serf of a Hungarian nobleman of great possessions in Transylvania, but although a serf, he was not by any means a poor or illiterate man. In fact, he was rich, and his intelligence and respectability were such that he had been raised by his lord to the stewardship, but whoever may happen to be born a serf, a serf must he remain, even though he become a wealthy man, and such was the condition of my father. My father had been married for about five years, and by his marriage had three children, my eldest brother, Cesar, myself, Hermann, and a sister named Marcella. You know, Philip, that Latin is still the language spoken in that country, and that will account for our high-sounding names. My mother was a very beautiful woman, unfortunately more beautiful than virtuous. She was seen and admired by the lord of the soil. My father was sent away upon some mission, and during his absence my mother, flattered by the attentions and won the assiduities of this nobleman, yielded to his wishes. It so happened that my father returned very unexpectedly and discovered the intrigue. The evidence of my mother's shame was positive. He surprised her in the company of her seducer. Carried away by the impetuosity of his feelings, he watched the opportunity of a meeting take, taking place between them, and murdered both his wife and her seducer. Conscious that, as a serf, not even the provocation which he had received would be allowed as a justification of his conduct, he hastily collected together what money he could lay his hands upon and as we were then in the depth of winter 
he put his horses to the sleigh and taking his children with him he set off in the middle of the night and was far away before the tragical circumstance had transpired aware that he would be pursued and that he had no chance of escape if he remained in any portion of his native country in which the authorities could lay hold of him he continued his flight without intermission until he had buried himself in the intricacies and seclusion of the hart's mountains of course all that i have now told you i learned afterwards my oldest recollections are knit to a rude yet comfortable cottage in which i lived with my father brother and sister it was on the confines of one of those vast forests which cover the northern part of germany around it were a few acres of ground which during the summer months my father cultivated and which though they yielded a doubtful harvest were sufficient for our support in the winter we remained much indoors for as my father followed the chase we were left alone and the wolves during that season incessantly prowled about my father had purchased the cottage and land about it of one of the rude foresters who gained their livelihood partly by hunting and partly by burning charcoal for the purpose of smelting the ore from the neighboring mines it was distant about two miles from any other habitation i can call to mind the whole landscape now the tall pines which rose up on the mountain above us and the wide expanse of the forest beneath on the topmost boughs and heads of whose trees we looked down from our cottage as the mountain below us rapidly descended into the distant valley in summer time the prospect was beautiful but during the severe winter a more desolate scene could not be well imagined i said that in the winter my father occupied himself with the chase every day he left us and often would he lock the door that we might not leave the cottage he had no one to assist him or to take care of us indeed it was not easy to find a female servant who would live in such solitude but could he have found one my father would not have received her for he had imbibed a horror of the sex as the difference of his conduct towards us his two boys and my poor little sister marcella evidently proved you may suppose we were sadly neglected indeed we suffered much for my father fearful that we might come to some harm would not allow us fuel when he left the cottage and we were obliged therefore to creep under the heaps of bearskins and there to keep ourselves as warm as we could until he returned in the evening when a blazing fire was our delight that my father chose this restless sort of life may appear strange but the fact was that he could not remain quiet whether from the remorse for having committed murder or from the misery consequent on his change of situation or from both combined he was never happy unless he was in a state of activity children however when left much to themselves acquire a thoughtfulness not common in to their age so it was with us and during the short cold days of winter we would sit silent longing for the happy hours when the snow would melt and the leaves would burst out and the birds begin their songs and when we should again be set at liberty such was our peculiar and savage sort of life until my brother cesar was nine myself seven and my sister five years old when the circumstances occurred on which is based the extraordinary narrative which i am about to relate one evening my father returned home rather late than usual he had been unsuccessful and as the weather was very severe and many feet of snow were upon the ground he was not only very cold but in a very bad humor he had brought in wood and we were all three gladly assisting each other in the blowing on the embers to create the blaze when he caught poor little marcella by the arm and threw her aside the child fell struck her mouth and bled very much my brother ran to raise her up accustomed to ill usage and afraid of my father she did not dare to cry 
but looked up in his face very pitously. My father drew his stool nearer to the hearth, muttered something in abuse of woman, and busied himself with the fire, which both my brother and I deserted when our sister was so unkindly treated. A cheerful blaze was soon the result of his exertions, but we did not, as usual, crowd round it. Marcella, still bleeding, retired to a corner, and my brother and I took our seats beside her. While my father hung over the fire gloomily and alone, such had been our position for about half an hour, when the howl of a wolf close under the window of the cottage fell on our ears. My father started up and seized his gun. The howl was repeated. He examined the priming and then hastily left the cottage, shutting the door after him. We all waited, anxiously listening, for we thought that if he succeeded in shooting the wolf, he would have returned in a better humor, and, although he was harsh to all of us, and particularly so to our little sister, still we loved our father, and loved to see him cheerful and happy, for what else had we to look up to? and I may here observe that perhaps there never were three children who were fonder of each other. We did not, like other children, fight and dispute together, and if, by chance, any disagreement did arise between my elder brother and me, little Marcella would run to us, and kissing us both, seal through her entries the peace between us. Marcella was a lovely, amiable child, I can recall her beautiful features even now. Alas, poor little Marcella. She is dead, then, observed Philip. Dead? Yes, dead. But how did she die? But I must not anticipate, Philip. Let me tell my story. We waited for some time, but the report of the gun did not reach us, and my elder brother then said, Our father has followed the wolf and will not be back for some time. Marcella, let us wash the blood from your mouth, and then we will leave this corner and go to the fire and warm ourselves. We did so and remained there until near midnight, every minute wondering, as it grew later, why our father did not return. We had no idea that he was in any danger, but we thought that he must have chased the wolf for a very long time. I will look out and see if father is coming, said my brother Caesar, going to the door. Take care, said Marcella. The wolves must be about now, and we cannot kill them, brother. My brother opened the door very cautiously, and but a few inches he peeped out. I see nothing, said he, after a time, and once more he joined us at the fire. We have had no supper, said I, for my father usually cooked the meat as soon as he came home, and during his absence we had nothing but the fragments of the preceding day. And if our father comes home after his hunt, Caesar, said Marcella, he will be pleased to have some supper. Let us cook it for him and for ourselves. Caesar climbed upon the stool and reached down some meat. I forgot now whether it was venison or bear's meat, but we cut off the usual quantity and proceeded to dress it, as we used to do under our father's superintendence. We were all busy putting it into the platters before the fire to await his coming, when we heard the sound of a horn. We listened. There was a noise outside, and a minute afterwards my father entered, ushering in a young female and a large dark man in a hunter's dress. Perhaps I had better now relate what was only known to me many years afterwards. When my father had left the cottage, he perceived a large white wolf about thirty yards from him, as soon as the animal saw my father, it retreated slowly, growling and snarling. My father followed. The animal did not run, but always kept at some distance, and my father did not like to fire until he was pretty certain that his ball would take effect. Thus they went on for some time, the wolf now leaving my father far behind, and then stopping and snarling defiance at him. And then, again, on his approach, setting off at speed. Anxious to shoot the animal, for the white wolf is very rare, my father continued the pursuit for several hours, during which he continually ascended the mountain. You must know, Philip, that there are some peculiar spots on those mountains, which are supposed, and, as my story will prove, truly supposed 
to be inhabited by the evil influences, they are well known to the huntsmen, who invariably avoid them. Now, one of these spots, an open space in the pine forest above us, had been pointed out to my father as dangerous on that account. But whether he disbelieved these wild stories, or whether in his eager pursuit of the chase he disregarded them, I know not. Certain, however, it is that he was decoyed by the white wolf to this open space, when the animal appeared to slacken her speed. My father approached, came close up to her, raised his gun to his shoulder, and was about to fire when the wolf suddenly disappeared. He thought that the snow on the ground must have dazzled his sight, and he let down his gun to look for the beast. But she was gone. How she could have escaped over the clearance without his seeing her was beyond his comprehension. Mortified at the ill success of his chase, he was about to retrace his steps when he heard the distant sound of a horn. Astonishment at such a sound, at such an hour, in such a wilderness, made him forget, for the moment, his disappointment, and he remained riveted to the spot. In a minute the horn was blown a second time and at no great distance my father stood still and listened. A third time it was blown. I forget the term used to express it, but it was a signal which, my father well knew, implied that the party was lost in the woods. In a few minutes more my father beheld a man on horseback, with a female seated on the crupper, entered the clear space, and ride up to him. At first my father called to mind the strange stories which he had heard of the supernatural beings who were said to frequent these mountains, but the nearer approach of the parties satisfied him that they were mortals like himself. As soon as they came up to him, the man who guided the horse accosted him. Friend Hunter, you are out late. The better fortune for us. We have ridden far and are in fear of our lives which are eagerly sought after. These mountains have enabled us to elude our pursuers, but if we find not shelter and refreshment, that will avail us little, as we must perish from hunger and the inclemency of the night. My daughter, who rides behind me, is now more dead than alive. Say, can you assist us in our difficulty? My cottage is some few miles distant, replied my father but I have little to offer you besides a shelter from the weather. To the little I have, you are welcome. May I ask whence you come? Yes, friend, it is no secret now. We have escaped from Transylvania, where my daughter's honor and my life were equally in jeopardy. This information was quite enough to raise an interest in my father's heart. He remembered his own escape. He remembered the loss of his wife's honor and the tragedy by which it was wound up. He immediately and warmly offered all the assistance which he could afford them. "'There is no time to be lost, then, good sir,' observed the horseman. "'My daughter is chilled with the frost, and cannot hold out much longer against the severity of the weather.' "'Follow me,' replied my father, leading the way towards his home. "'I was lured away in pursuit of a large wolf,' observed my father. "'It came to the very window of my hut. Or." I should not have been out at this time of night. The creature passed us by just as we came out of the wood, replied the female in a silvery tone. I was nearly discharging my piece at it, observed the hunter, but since it did us such good service, I am glad I allowed it to escape. In about an hour and a half, during which my father walked at a rapid pace, the party arrived at the cottage, and, as I said before, came in. We are in good time, apparently, observed the dark hunter, catching the smell of roasted meat as he walked to the fire and surveyed my brother and sister, and myself. You have young cooks here, Meinherr. I am glad that we shall not have to wait, replied my father. Come, mistress, seat yourself by the fire. You require warmth after your cold ride. And where can I put up my horse, Meinherr? observed the huntsman. I will take care of him, replied my father going out of the cottage door. The female must, however, be particularly described. She was young and apparently twenty years of age. She was dressed in a traveling dress, deeply bordered with white fur, and wore a cap of white ermine on her head. 
Her features were very beautiful, at least I thought so, and so my father has since declared. Her hair was flaxen, glossy, and shining, and bright as a mirror, and her mouth, although somewhat large when it was open, showed the most brilliant teeth I have ever beheld. But there was something about her eyes, bright as they were, which made us children afraid. They were so restless, so furtive. I could not, at that time, tell why, but I felt as if there was a cruelty in her eye, and when she beckoned us to come to her, we approached her with fear and trembling. Still, she was beautiful, very beautiful. She spoke kindly to my brother and myself, patted our heads and caressed us, but Marcella would not come near her. On the contrary, she slunk away and hid herself in the bed, and would not wait for the supper, which half an hour before she had been so anxious for. My father, having put the horse into a closed shed, soon returned, and supper was placed upon the table. When it was over, my father requested that the young lady would take possession of his bed, and he would remain at the fire and sit up with her father. After some hesitation on her part, this arrangement was agreed to, and I and my brother crept into the other bed with Marcella, for we had as yet always slept together. But we could not sleep. There was something so unusual, not only in seeing strange people, but in having those people sleep at the cottage, that we were bewildered. As for poor little Marcella, she was quiet, but I perceived that she trembled during the whole night, and sometimes I thought she was checking a sob. My father had brought out some spirits, which he rarely used, and he and the strange hunter remained drinking and talking before the fire. Our ears were ready to catch the slightest whisper, so much was our curiosity excited. You said you came from Transylvania, observed my father. Even so, mynheer, replied the hunter. I was a serf to the noble house of undisclosed. My master would insist upon my surrendering up my fair girl to his wishes. It ended in my giving him a few inches of my hunting knife. We are countrymen and brothers in misfortune, replied my father, taking the huntsman's hands and pressing it warmly. Indeed, are you then from that country? Yes and I too have fled for my life. But mine is a melancholy tale. Your name? inquired the hunter. Krantz. What? Krantz of... undisclosed. I have heard your tale. You need not renew your grief by repeating it now. Welcome, most welcome, mynheer. And I may say, my worthy kinsman, I am your second cousin, Wilford of Barnstorff, cried the hunter, rising up and embracing my father. They filled their horn mugs to the brim, and drank to one another after the German fashion. The conversation was then carried on in a low tone. All that we could collect from it was that our new relative and his daughter were to take up their abode in our cottage, at least for the present. In about an hour they both fell back in their chairs and appeared to sleep. Marcella, dear, did you hear that? said my brother in a low tone. Yes, replied Marcella in a whisper. I heard all. Oh, brother, I cannot bear to look upon that woman. I feel so frightened. My brother made no reply, and shortly afterwards we were all three fast asleep. When we awoke the next morning, we found that the hunter's daughter had risen before us. I thought she looked more beautiful than ever. She came up to Marcella and caressed her. The child burst into tears and sobbed as if her heart would break. But, not to detain you with my too long a story, the huntsman and his daughter were accommodated in the cottage. My father and he went out hunting daily, leaving Christina with us. She performed all the household duties, was very kind to us children, and, gradually, the dislike even of little Marcella wore away. But a great change took place in my father. He appeared to have conquered his aversion to the sex and was most attentive to Christina. Often, after her father and we were in bed, he would sit up with her, conversing in a low tone by the fire. I ought to have mentioned that my father and the huntsman Wilford slept in another portion of the cottage, and that the bed which he formerly occupied, in which was in the same room as ours, had been given up to the use of Christina. These visitors had been about three weeks at the cottage, when one night, after we children had been sent to bed, a consultation was held. 
my father had asked christina in marriage and had obtained her own consent and that of wilford after this a conversation took place which was as nearly as i can recollect as follows you may take my child mein herr kranz and my blessing with her and i shall then leave you and seek some other habitation it matters little where why not remain here wilford no no i am called elsewhere let that suffice and ask no more questions you have my child i thank you for her and will duly value her but there is one difficulty i know what you would say there is no priest here in this wild country true neither is there any law to bind still must some ceremony pass between you to satisfy a father will you consent to marry her after my fashion if so i will marry you directly i will replied my father then take her by the hand now mine hair swear i swear repeated my father by all the spirits of the heart's mountains nay why not in heaven interrupted my father because it is not my humor rejoined wilford if i prefer that oath less binding perhaps than another surely you will not thwart me well be it so then have your humor will you make me swear by that in which i do not believe yet many do so who in outward appearance are christians rejoined wilford say will you be married or shall i take my daughter away with me proceed replied my father impatiently i swear by all the spirits of the heart's mountains by all their power for good or evil that i take christina for my wedded wife that i will ever protect her cherish her and love her that my hand shall never be raised against her to harm her my father repeated the words after wilford and if i fail in this my vow may all the vengeance of the spirits fall upon me and upon my children may they perish by the vulture by the wolf or other beast of the forest may their flesh be torn from their limbs and their bones blanch in the wilderness all this i swear my father hesitated as he repeated the last words little marcella could not restrain herself and as my father repeated the last sentence she burst into tears this sudden interruption appeared to discompose the party particularly my father he spoke harshly to the child who controlled her sobs burying her face under her bedclothes such was the second marriage of my father the next morning the hunter wilfred mounted his horse and rode away my father resumed his bed which was in the same room as ours and things went on much as before the marriage except that our new mother-in-law did not show any kindness towards us indeed during my father's absence she would often beat us particularly little marcella and her eyes would flash fire as she looked eagerly upon the fair and lovely child one night my sister awoke me and my brother what is the matter said caesar she has gone out whispered marcella gone out yes gone out at the door in her night clothes replied the child i saw her get out of bed look at my father to see if he slept and then she went out at the door what could induce her to leave her bed all undressed to go out in such bitter wintry weather with the snow deep on the ground was to us incomprehensible we lay awake and in about an hour we heard the growl of a wolf close under the window there is a wolf said caesar she will be torn to pieces oh no cried marcella and a few minutes afterwards a mother-in-law appeared she was in her night-dress as marcella had stated she let down the latch of the door so as to make no noise went to a pail of water and washed her face and hands and then slipped into bed where my father lay we all three trembled we hardly knew why but we resolved to watch the next night we did so and not only on the ensuing night but on many others and always at about the same hour would our mother-in-law rise from her bed and leave the cottage and after she was gone we invariably heard the growl of a wolf under our window and always saw her on her return wash herself before she retired to bed we observed also that she seldom sat down at meals and that when she did she appeared to eat with dislike but when the meat was taken down to be prepared for dinner she would often furtively put a raw piece into her mouth my brother caesar was a courageous boy 
he did not like to speak to my father until he knew more he resolved that he would follow her out and ascertain what she did marcella and i endeavoured to dissuade him from this project but he would not be controlled and the very next night he lay down in his clothes and as soon as our mother-in-law had left the cottage he jumped up took down my father's gun and followed her you may imagine in what a state of suspense marcella and i remained during his absence after a few minutes we heard the report of a gun it did not awaken my father and we lay trembling with anxiety in a minute afterwards we saw our mother-in-law enter the cottage her dress was bloody i put my hand to marcella's mouth to prevent her crying out although i was myself in great alarm our mother-in-law approached my father's bed looked to see if he was asleep and then went to the chimney and blew up the embers into a blaze who is there said my father waking up lie still dearest replied my mother-in-law it is only me i have lighted the fire to warm some water i am not quite well my father turned round and was soon asleep but we watched our mother-in-law she changed her linen and threw the garment she had worn into the fire and we then perceived that her right leg was bleeding profusely as if from a gunshot wound she bandaged it up and then dressing herself remained before the fire until the break of day poor little marcella her heart beat quick as she pressed me to her side so indeed did mine where was our brother caesar how did my mother-in-law receive the wound unless from his gun at last my father rose then for the first time i spoke saying father where is my brother caesar your brother exclaimed he why where can he be merciful heaven i thought as i lay very restless last night observed our mother-in-law that i had heard some one open the latch of the door and dear me husband what was become of your gun my father cast his eyes above the chimney and perceived that his gun was missing for a moment he looked perplexed then seizing a broad axe he went out of the cottage without saying another word he did not remain away from us long in a few minutes he returned bearing in his arms the mangled body of my poor brother he laid it down and covered up his face my mother-in-law rose up and looked at the body while marcella and i threw ourselves by its side wailing and sobbing bitterly go to bed again children said she sharply husband continued she your boy must have taken the gun down to shoot a wolf and the animal has been too powerful for him poor boy he has paid dearly for his rashness my father made no reply i wished to speak to tell all but marcella who perceived my intention held me by the arm and looked at me so imploringly that i desisted my father therefore was left in his error but marcella and i although we could not comprehend it were conscious that our mother-in-law was in some way connected with my brother's death that day my father went out and dug a grave and when he hid the body in the earth he piled up stones over it so that the wolves should not be able to dig it up the shock of this catastrophe was to my poor father very severe for several days he never went to the chase although at times he would utter bitter anthemas and vengeance against the wolves but during this time of mourning on his part my mother-in-law's nocturnal wanderings continued with the same regularity as before at last my father took down his gun to repair to the forest but he soon returned and appeared much annoyed would you believe it christina that the wolves partition to the whole race have actually contrived to dig up the body of my poor boy and now there is nothing left but his bones indeed replied my mother-in-law marcella looked at me and i saw in her intelligent eye all she would have uttered a wolf growls under our window every night father said i ay indeed why did you not tell me boy wake me the next time you hear it i saw my mother-in-law turn away her eyes flashed fire and she gnashed her teeth my father went out again and covered up with a larger pile of stones the little remnants of my poor brother which the wolves had spared such was the first act of tragedy the spring now came on the snow disappeared and we were permitted to leave the cottage but never would i quit for one moment my dear little sister to whom since the death of my brother i was more ardently attached than ever indeed i was afraid to leave her alone with my mother-in-law 
who appeared to have a particular pleasure in ill-treating the child my father was now employed upon his little farm and i was able to render him some assistance marcella used to sit by us while we were at work leaving my mother-in-law alone in the cottage i ought to observe that as the spring advanced so did my mother-in-law decrease her nocturnal rambles and that we never heard the growl of the wolf under the window after i had spoken of it to my father one day when my father and i were in the field marcella being with us my mother-in-law came out saying that she was going into the forest to collect some herbs my father wanted and that marcella must go to the cottage and watch the dinner marcella went and my mother-in-law soon disappeared into the forest taking a direction quite contrary to that in which the cottage stood and leaving my father and i as it were between her and marcella about an hour afterwards we were startled by the shrieks from the cottage evidently the shrieks of little marcella marcella has burnt herself father said i throwing down my spade my father threw down his and we both hastened to the cottage before we could gain the door out darted a large white wolf which fled with the utmost celerity my father had no weapon he rushed into the cottage and there saw poor little marcella expiring her body was dreadfully mangled and the blood pouring from it had formed a large pool on the cottage floor my father's first intention had been to seize his gun and pursue but he was checked by the horrid spectacle he knelt down by his dying child and burst into tears marcella could just look kindly on us for a few seconds and then her eyes were closed in death my father and i still hanging over my poor sister's body when my mother-in-law came in at the dreadful sight she expressed much concern but she did not appear to recoil from the sight of blood as most women do poor child said she it must have been that great white wolf which passed me just now and frightened me so she's quite dead kranz i know it i know it cried my father in agony i thought my father would never recover from the effects of the second tragedy he mourned bitterly over the body of his sweet child and for several days would not consign it to its grave although frequently requested by my mother-in-law to do so at last he yielded and dug a grave for her close by that of my poor brother and took every precaution that the wolves should not violate her remains i was now really miserable as i lay alone in the bed which i had formerly shared with my brother and sister i could not help thinking that my mother-in-law was implicit in both of their deaths although i could not account for the manner but i no longer felt afraid of her my little heart was full of hatred and revenge the night after my sister had been buried as i lay awake i perceived my mother-in-law get up and go out of the cottage i waited some time then dressed myself and looked out through the door which i half opened the moon shone bright and i could see the spot where my brother and my sister had been buried and what was my horror when i perceived my mother-in-law busily removing the stones from marcella's grave she was in her white nightdress and the moon shone full upon her she was digging with her hands and throwing away the stones behind her with all the ferocity of a wild beast it was some time before i could collect my senses and decide what i should do at last i perceived that she had arrived at the body and raised it up the side of the grave i could bear it no longer i ran to my father and awoke him father father cried i dress yourself and get your gun what cried my father the wolves are there are they he jumped out of bed threw on his clothes and in his anxiety did not appear to perceive the absence of his wife as soon as he was ready i opened the door he went out and i followed him imagine his horror when unprepared as he was for such a sight he beheld as he advanced towards the grave not a wolf but his wife in her nightdress on her hands and knees crouching by the body of my sister and tearing off large pieces of the flesh and devouring them with all the avidity of a wolf she was too busy to be aware of our approach my father dropped his gun his hair stood on end so did mine he breathed heavily then his breath for a time stopped i picked up the gun and put it into his hand suddenly he appeared as if concentrated rage had restored him to double vigor 
he levelled his piece fired and with a loud shriek down fell the wretch whom he had fostered in his bosom god of heaven cried my father sinking down upon the earth in a swoon as soon as he discharged his gun i remained some time by his side before he recovered where am i said he what has happened oh yes yes i recollect now heaven forgive me he rose and we walked up to the grave what again was our astonishment and horror to find that instead of the dead body of my mother-in-law as we expected there was lying over the remains of my poor sister a large white she-wolf the white wolf exclaimed my father the white wolf which decoyed me into the forest i see it all now i have dealt with the spirits of the heart's mountains for some time my father remained in silence and deep thought he then carefully lifted up the body of my sister replaced it in the grave and covered it over as before having struck the head of the dead animal with the heel of his boot and raving like a madman he walked back to the cottage shut the door and threw himself on the bed i did the same for i was in a stupor of amazement early in the morning we were both roused by a loud knocking at the door and in rushed the hunter wilford my daughter man my daughter where is my daughter cried he in rage where the wretch the fiend should be i trust replied my father starting up and displaying equal choler where should she be in hell leave the cottage or you may fare worse ha ha replied the hunter would you harm a potent spirit of the heart's mountains poor mortal who must needs wed a werewolf out demon i defy thee and thy power yet shall you feel it remember your oath your solemn oath never to raise your hand against her to harm her i made no compact with evil spirits you did and if you failed in your vow you were to meet the vengeance of the spirits your children were to perish by the vulture the wolf out out demon and their bones blanched in the wilderness ha ha my father frantic with rage seized his axe and raised it over wilford's head to strike all this i swear continued the huntsman mockingly the axe descended but it passed through the form of the hunter and my father lost his balance and fell heavily on the floor mortal said the hunter striding over my father's body we have power over those who have committed murder you have been guilty of a double murder you shall pay the penalty attached to your marriage vow two of your children are gone and the third is yet to follow and follow them he will for your oath is registered go it were kindness to kill thee your punishment is that you shall live with these words the spirit disappeared my father rose from the floor embraced me tenderly and knelt down in prayer the next morning he quitted the cottage forever he took me with him and bent his steps to holland where we safely arrived he had some little money with him but he had not been many days in amsterdam before he was seized with brain fever and died raving mad i was put into the asylum and afterwards was sent to sea before the mast you know now all my history the question is whether i am to pay the penalty of my father's oath i am myself perfectly convinced that in some way or another i shall on the twenty-second day the high land of the south sumatra was in view as there were no vessels in sight they resolved to keep their course through the straits and run for pulupalong which they expected as their vessel lay so close to the wind to reach in seven or eight days by constant exposure philip and kranz were now br so bronzed that with their long beards and Mussulman dresses they might easily have passed off for natives they had steered the whole of the days exposed to a burning sun they had lain down and slept in the dew of the night but their health had not suffered but for several days since he had confided the history of his family to philip kranz had become silent and melancholy his usual flow of spirits had vanished and philip had often questioned him as to the cause as they entered the straits philip talked of what they should do upon their arrival at goa when kranz gravely replied for some days philip i have had a presentiment that i shall never see that city you are out of health kranz replied philip no i am in sound health body and mind i have endeavored to shake off the presentiment but in vain there is a warning voice that continually tells me that i shall not be long with you philip 
will you oblige by making me content on one point i have gold about my person which may be useful to you oblige me by taking it and securing your own what nonsense kranz it is no nonsense philip have you not had your warnings why should i not have mine you know that i have little fear in my composition and that i care not about death but i feel the presentment which i speak of more strongly every hour it is some kind of spirit who would warn me to prepare for another world be it so i have lived long enough in this world to leave it without regret although to part with you and i mean the only two now dear to me is painful i acknowledge may not this arise from your overexertion and fatigue kranz consider how much excitement you have labored under within these last four months is not that enough to create a corresponding depression depend upon it my dear friend such is the fact i wish it were but i feel otherwise and there is a feeling of gladness connected with the idea that i am to leave this world arising from another presentment which equally occupies my mind i hardly can tell you but a mean and you are connected with it in my dreams i have seen you meet again but it has appeared to me as if a portion of your trial was purposely shut from my sight in dark clouds and i have asked may not i see what is there concealed and an invisible has answered no twould make you wretched before these trials take place you will be summoned away and then i have thanked heaven and felt resigned these are the imaginings of a disturbed brain kranz that i am destined to suffering may be true but why a mean should suffer or why you young in full health and vigor should not pass your days in peace and live to a good old age there is no cause for believing you'll be better tomorrow perhaps so replied kranz but still you must yield to my whim and take the gold if i am wrong and we do arrive safe you know philip you can let me have it back observed kranz with a faint smile but you forget our water is nearly out and we must look out for a rill on the coast to obtain a fresh supply i was thinking of that when you commenced this unwelcome topic we had better look out for the water before dark and as soon as we have replenished our jars we will make sail again at the time that this conversation took place they were on the eastern side of the strait about forty miles to the northward the interior of the coast was a rocky and mountainous but it slowly descended to low land of alternate forest and jungles which continued to the beach the country appeared to be uninhabited keeping close in to the shore they discovered after two hours run a fresh stream which burst in a cascade from the mountains and swept its devious course through the jungle until it poured its tribute into the waters of the strait they ran close in to the mouth of the stream lowered the sails and pulled the pacora against the current until they had advanced far enough to assure them that the water was quite fresh the jars were soon filled and they were again thinking of pushing off when enticed by the beauty of the spot the coolness of the fresh water and wearied with their long confinement on board of the pacora they proposed to a bath a luxury hardly to be appreciated by those who have not been in a similar situation they threw off their muslim men dresses and plunged into the stream where they remained for some time kranz was the first to get out he complained of feeling chilled and he walked on the banks where their clothes had been laid philip also approached nearer to the beach intending to follow him and now philip said kranz this will be a good opportunity for me to give you the money i will open my sash and pour it out and you can put it into your own before you put it on philip was standing in the water which was about level with his waist well kranz said he i supposed if it must be so it must but it appears to me an idea so ridiculous however you shall have it your own way philip quitted the run and sat down by kranz who was already busy in shaking the doubloons out of the folds of his sash at last he said i believe philip you have got them all now i feel satisfied what danger there can be to you which i am not equally exposed to i cannot conceive replied philip however 
hardly he had said these words when there was a tremendous roar a rush like a mighty wind through the air a blow which threw him on his back a loud cry and a contention philip recovered himself and perceived the naked form of krantz carried off with the speed of an arrow by an enormous tiger through the jungle he watched with distended eyeballs in a few seconds the animal and krantz had disappeared god of heaven would that thou hadst spared me cried philip throwing himself down in agony on his face oh krantz my friend my brother too sure was your presentiment merciful god have pity but thy will be done and philip burst into a flood of tears for more than an hour did he remain fixed upon the spot careless and indifferent to the danger by which he was surrounded at last somewhat recovered he rose dressed himself uh, then again sat down his eyes fixed upon the clothes of krantz and the gold which still lay on the sand he would give me that gold he foretold his doom yes yes it was his destiny and it has been fulfilled his bones will bleach into the wilderness and the spirit hunter and his wolfish daughter are avenged the shades of evening now set in and the low growling of the beast in the forest recalled philip to a sense of his own danger he thought of Amin, and hastily making the clothes of Krantz and the doubloons into a package, he stepped into the pakora, with difficulty shoved it off, and with a melancholy heart and in silence hoisted the sail and pursued his course. Yes, Amin, thought Philip, as he watched the stars twinkling and coruscating, yes, you are right, when you assert that the destinies of men are foreknown, and may by some be read, my destiny is, alas, that i should be severed from all i value upon earth and die friendless and alone then welcome death if such is to be the case welcome a thousand welcomes what a relief wilt thou be to me what joy to find myself summoned to where the weary are at rest i have my task to fulfil god grant it that it may soon be accomplished and let not my life be embittered by any more trials such as this again did philip weep for krantz had been his long-tried valued friend his partner all his dangers and provisions from the period that they had met when the dutch fleet attempted the passage round cape horn after seven days of painful watching and brooding over bitter thoughts philip arrived at pulipalong where he found a vessel about to sail for the city to which he was destined he ran his pakora alongside of her and found that she was a brig under the portuguese flag having however but two portuguese on board the rest of the crew being natives representing himself as an englishman in the portuguese service who had been wrecked and offering to pay for his passage he was willingly received and in a few days the vessel sailed their voyage was prosperous in six weeks they anchored in the roads of goya the next day they went up the river the portuguese captain informed philip where he might obtain lodging in passing him off as one of the crew there was no difficulty raised as to his landing having located himself at his new lodging philip commenced some inquiries of his host relative to amine designating her merely as a young woman who had arrived there in a vessel some weeks before but he could not obtain no information concerning her signor said the host Tomorrow is the grand auto de fe. We can do nothing until that is over. Afterwards, I will put you in the way to find what you wish. In the meantime, you can walk about the town. Tomorrow I will take you to where you can behold the grand procession, and then we will try what we can do to assist you in your search. Philip went out, procured a suit of clothes, removed his beard, and then walked about the town, looking up at every window to see if he could perceive a mean at a corner of one of the streets he thought he recognized father matthias and ran up to him but the monk had drawn his cowl over his head and when addressed by that name made no reply i was deceived thought philip but i really thought it was him and philip was right it was father matthias who thus screened himself from philip's recognition tired at last he returned to his hotel just before it was dark the company there were numerous everybody for miles distant had come to goya to witness the auto de fe and everybody was discussing the ceremony i will see this grand procession said philip to himself as he threw himself on his bed it will drive thought from me for a time and god knows how painful my thoughts have now become 
Amin, dear Amin, may angels guard thee. End of the White Wolf of the Hearts Mountains by Frederick Marriott John Connors and the Fairies by Jeremiah Curtin There was a man named John Connors who lived near Killarney and was the father of seven small children, all daughters and no sons. Connors fell into such rage and anger at having so many daughters without any sons that when the seventh daughter was born he would not come from the field to see the mother or the child. When the time came for christening he wouldn't go for sponsors and didn't care whether the wife lived or died. A couple of years after that, a son was born to him, and some of the women ran to the field and told John Connors that he was the father of a fine boy. Connors was so delighted that he caught the spade he had with him and broke it on the ditch. He hurried home then and sent for bread and meat with provisions of all kinds to supply the house. "'There are no people in this parish,' said he to the wife, "'fit to stand sponsors for this boy, and when night comes I'll ride over to the next parish and find sponsors there.' When night came, he bridled and saddled his horse, mounted and rode away toward the neighboring parish, to invite a friend and his wife to be godfather and godmother to his son. The village to which he was going was Beaufort, south of Killarney. There was a public house on the road. Connors stepped in and treated the bystanders, delayed there a while, and then went his way. When he had gone a couple of miles, he met a stranger riding on a white horse a good-looking gentleman wearing red knee-breeches, swallow-tailed coat, and a Caroline hat, a tall hat. The stranger saluted John Connors, and John returned the salute. The stranger asked where he was going at such an hour. "'I'm going,' said Connors, "'to Beaufort, to find sponsors for my young son.' "'Oh, you foolish man,' said the stranger, "'you left the road a mile behind you. Turn back and take the left hand.' John Connors turned back as directed, but never came to a crossroad. He was riding about half an hour when he met the same gentleman, who asked, Are you the man I met a while ago going to Beaufort? I am. Why, you fool, you passed the road a mile or more behind. Turn back and take the right-hand road. What trouble is on you that you cannot see a road when you are passing it? Connors turned and rode for an hour or so, but found no side road. The same stranger met him for the third time, and asked him the same question, and told him he must turn back. But the night is so far gone, said he, that you'd better not be waking people. My house is nearby. Stay with me till morning. You can go for the sponsors tomorrow. John Connors thanked the stranger, and said he would go with him. The stranger took him to a fine castle then, and told him to dismount and come in. Your horse will be taken care of, said he. I have servants enough. John Connors rode a splendid white horse, and the like of him wasn't in the country round. The gentleman had a good supper brought to Connors. After supper, he showed him a bed and said, Take off your clothes and sleep soundly till morning. When Connors was asleep, the stranger took the clothes, formed a corpse just like John Connors, put the clothes on it, tied the body to the horse, and, leading the beast outside, turned its head towards home. He kept John Connors asleep in bed for three weeks. The horse went towards home and reached the village next morning. The people saw the horse with the dead body on its back, and all thought it was the body of John Connors. Everybody began to cry and lament for their neighbor. He was taken off the horse, stripped, washed, and laid out on the table. There was a great wake that night, everybody mourning and lamenting over him. For wasn't he a good man and the father of a large family? The priest was sent for to celebrate Mass and attend the funeral, which he did. There was a large funeral. Three weeks later, John Connors was roused from his sleep by the gentleman, who came to him and said, It is high time for you to be waking. Your son is christened. The wife, thinking you would never come, had the child baptized, and the priest found sponsors. Your horse stole away from here and went home. Sure, then, I'm not long sleeping. Indeed, then, you are. It is three whole days and nights that you were in that bed. John Connor sat up and looked around for his clothes, but if he did, he could not see a stitch of them. Where are my clothes? asked he. I know nothing of your clothes, my man, and the sooner you go out of this, the better. Poor John was astonished. God help me, how am I to go home without my clothes? If I had a shirt itself, it wouldn't be so bad, 
but to go without a rag at all on me. Don't be talking, said the man. Take a sheet and be off with yourself. I have no time to lose on the like of you. John grew and dreaded the man, and taking the sheet, went out. When well away from the place, he turned to look at the castle and its owner, but if he did, there was nothing before him but fields and ditches. The time, as it happened, was Sunday morning, and Connor saw at some distance down the road people on their way to Mass. He hurried to the fields for fear of being seen by somebody. He kept the fields and walked close to the ditches till he reached the side of a hill, and went along by that, keeping well out of sight. As he was nearing his own village at the side of the mountain, there happened to be three or four little boys looking for stray sheep. Seeing Connors, they knew him as the dead man buried three weeks before. They screamed and ran away home, some of them falling with fright. When they came to the village, they cried that they had seen John Connors and he with a sheet on him. Now it is the custom in Ireland, when a person dies, to sprinkle holy water on the clothes of the deceased and then give them to poor people, or to friends, for God's sake. It is thought that by giving the clothes in this way, the former owner has them to use in the other world. The person who wears the clothes must wear them three times to mass one Sunday after another and sprinkle them each time with holy water. After that, they may be worn as the person likes. When the women of the village heard the story of the boys, some of them went to the widow and said, "'Tis your fault that your husband's ghost is roaming around in nakedness. You didn't give away his clothes." I did indeed, said the wife. I did my part. But it must be that the man I gave them to didn't wear them to mass, and that is why my poor husband is naked in the other world. Now she went straight to the relative and neighbor who got the clothes. As she entered, the man was sitting down to breakfast. Bad luck to you, ye heathen, said she. I did not think you the man to leave my poor John naked in the other world. Ye neither went to mass in the clothes I gave you, nor sprinkled holy water on them. I did indeed. This is the third Sunday since John died, and I went to Mass this morning for the third time. Sure I'd be a heathen to keep a relative naked in the other world. It wasn't your husband that the boys saw at all. She went home then, satisfied that everything had been done as it should be. An uncle of John Connors lived in the same village. He was a rich farmer and kept a servant girl and a servant boy. The turf bog was not far away, and all the turf at the house being burned, the servant girl was told to go down to the reek, a long pile of turf, and bring home a creel or basket of turf. She went to the reek and was filling her creel, when she happened to look towards the far end of the reek, and there she saw a man sticking his head out from behind the turf, and he with a sheet on him. She looked a second time and saw John Connors. The girl screamed, threw down the creel, and ran away, falling every few steps from terror. It was to the reek that Connors had gone to wait there in hiding till dark. After that, he could go to his own home without anyone seeing him. The servant girl fell senseless across the farmer's threshold, and when she recovered, she said, John Connors is below in the bog, behind the reek of turf, and nothing but a sheet on him. The farmer and the servant boy laughed at her and said, This is the way with you always when there's work to do. The boy started off to bring the turf himself, but as he was coming near the reek, John Connors thrust his head out, and the boy ran home screeching worse than the girl. Nobody would go near the creek now, and the report went out that John Connors was below in the bog minding the turf. Early that evening, John Connors wife made her children go on their knees and offer up the rosary for the repose of their father's soul. After the rosary, they went to bed in a room together, but were not long in it when there was a rap at the door. The poor woman asked who was outside. John Connors answered that it was himself. May the Almighty God and His Blessed Mother give rest to your soul, cried the wife, and the children crossed themselves and covered their heads with the bedclothes. They were in dread. He'd come in through the keyhole. They knew a ghost could do that if it wished. John went to the window of two panes of glass and was tapping at that. The poor woman looked out, and there she saw her husband's face. She began to pray again for the repose of his soul, but he called out, Bad luck to you. Won't you open the door to me, or throw out some clothes? I'm perishing from cold. This only convinced the woman more surely. John didn't like to break the door, and as it was strong, it wouldn't be easy for him to break it, so he left the house and went to his uncle's. When he came to the door, all the family were on their knees repeating the rosary for the soul of John Connors. He knocked, and the servant girl rose up to see who was outside. 
she unbolted and unlatched the door opened it a bit but seeing connor's she came near to cutting his nose off she shut it that quickly in his face she bolted the door then and began to scream john connor's ghost is haunting me not another day or night will i stay in the house if i live to see morning all the family fastened themselves in in a room and threw themselves into bed forgetting to undress or to finish their prayers john connors began to kick the door but nobody would open it then he tapped at the window and begged the uncle to let him in or put out some clothes to him but the uncle and children were out of their wits with fear the doctor's house was the next one and connors thought to himself i might as well go to the doctor and tell all to him tell him that the village has gone mad so he made his way to the doctor's but the servant boy there roared and screeched from terror when he saw him ran to his master and said john connor's ghost is below at the door and not a thing but a sheet on him you were always a fool said the doctor there is never a ghost in this world god knows then the ghost of john connor's is at the door said the boy to convince the boy the master raised the upper window he looked out and saw the ghost sure enough down went the window with a slap don't open the door cried the doctor he is below there's some mystery in this since the doctor wouldn't let him in any more than the others john connors was cursing and swearing terribly god be good to us said the doctor his soul must be damned for if his soul was in purgatory it is not cursing and swearing he'd be but praying surely tis damned he is and the lord have mercy on the people of this village but i won't stay another day in it i'll move to the town to-morrow morning now john left the doctor's house and went to the priest thinking that he could make all clear to the priest for everyone else had gone mad he knocked at the priest's door and the housekeeper opened it she screamed and ran away but left the door open behind her as she was running towards the stairs she fell and the priest hearing the fall hurried out to see what the matter was oh father cried the housekeeper john connor's ghost is below in the kitchen and he with only a sheet on him not true said the priest there's never a person seen after parting with this world the words were barely out of his mouth when the ghost was there before him in the name of god said the priest are you dead or alive you must be dead for i said mass in your house and you a corpse on the table and i was at your funeral how can you be foolish like the people of the village i'm alive who would kill me god who kills everybody but for your being dead how was i to be asked to your funeral "'Tis all a mistake,' said John. "'If it's dead I was, it isn't here I'd be talking to you tonight. "'If you're alive, where are your clothes? "'I don't know where they are or how they went from me, "'but I haven't them, sure enough. "'Go into the kitchen,' said the priest. "'I'll bring you clothes, and then you must tell me what happened to you.' "'When John had the clothes on, he told the priest, "'the day the child was born he went to Beaufort for sponsors, "'and being late he met a gentleman who sent him back and forth on the road "'and then took him to his house.' I went to bed, said John, and slept till he waked me. My clothes were gone from me then, and I had nothing to wear but an old sheet. More than this I don't know, but everybody runs from me, and my wife won't let me into the house. Oh, then it's Daniel O'Donohue, King of Loch Lane, that played the trick on you, said the priest. Why didn't you get sponsors at home in this parish for your son, as you did for your daughters? For the remainder of your life, show no partiality to son or daughter among your children. It would be a just punishment if more trouble came to you. You were not content with the will of God, though it is the duty of every man to take what God gives him. Three weeks ago your supposed body was buried, and all thought you dead through your own pride and willfulness. That is why my wife wouldn't let me in. Now, your reverence, come with me and convince my wife, or she will not open the door. The priest and John Connors went to the house and knocked, but the answer they got was a prayer for the repose of John Connors' soul. The priest went to the window then and called out to open the door. Mrs. Connors opened the door, and seeing her husband behind the priest, she screamed and fell. A little girl that was with her at the door dropped speechless on the floor. When the woman recovered, the priest began to persuade her that her husband was living, but she wouldn't believe that he was alive till she took hold of his hand. Then she felt of his face and hair and was convinced. When the priest had explained everything, he went away home. No matter how large his family was in after years, John Connors never went from home to find sponsors. End of John Connors and the Fairies Recording by Colleen McMahon
The Goth from Uncanny Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paddy Finnegan. Uncanny Tales, compiled by Cyril Arthur Pearson. Chapter 6. The Goth. Young Cargill smiled as Mrs. Lardner finished her account. And do you really think that the fact the poor chap was drowned had anything to do with it? he asked. Why, you admit yourself that he was known to have been drinking just before he fell out of his boat. You may say what you like, returned his hostess impressively, but since first we came to live at Trinia Wilfer, only four people besides poor Roberts have defied the fates, and each of them was drowned within the year. They were all tourists, she added, with something suspiciously like satisfaction. I'm not a superstitious man myself, supplemented the Major, but you can't get away from the facts, you know, Cargill. Cargill said no more. He perceived that they had lived long enough in retirement in this little Welsh village to have acquired a pride in its legend. The legend and its mountains are the two attractions of Trainy Wilfer. The official guidebook divides an equal amount of space to each. It will tell you that the bay, across which the quarry's tramp steamers now sail, was once dry land on which stood a village. Deep in the water, the remains of this village can still be seen in clear weather. But whosoever dares to look upon them will be drowned within the year. A local publication gives full details of those who've looked and perished. The legend had received an unexpected boom in the drowning of Roberts, which had just occurred. Roberts was a fisherman who had recently come back from the south. One calm day in February, he had rowed out into the bay in fulfilment of a drunken boast. He was drowned three days before midsummer. After dinner, young Cargill forgot about it. He forgot almost everything except Betty Lardner. But... Oddly enough, as he walked back to the hotel, it was just Betty Lardner who made him think again of the legend. He was in love, and being very young, wanted to do something insanely heroic. To defy the fates by looking at the sunken village was an obvious outlet for heroism. He must have thought a good deal about it before he fell asleep, for he remembered his resolution on the following morning. After breakfast, he sauntered along the brief strip of asphalt which the villagers believed to be a promenade. He was not actually thinking of the legend. To be precise, he was thinking of Betty Lardner. But he was suddenly reminded of it by a boatman pressing him for custom. Yes, he said abruptly, I will hire your boat if you'll row me out to the sunken village. I want to look at it. The Welshman eyed him suspiciously perceived that he wasn't joking, and shook his head. Come, persisted Cargill, I will make it a sovereign if you care to do it. Thank you, but indeed no, sir, replied the Welshman. Not if it was a hundred sovereigns. Surely you're not afraid? It is not fit, retorted the Welshman, turning on his heel. It was probably this opposition that made young Cargill decide that it would be really worth while to defy the legend. He did not approach the only other boatman. He considered the question of swimming. The knowledge that the distance there and back was nearly five miles did not render the feat impossible, for he was a champion swimmer. But he soon thought of a better way. He went back to the hotel and sought out Bissett. Bissett was a fellow member of the Middle Temple, as contentedly briefless as himself. And Bissett possessed a motorboat. Bissett was not entirely keen on the prospect. Don't you think it's a rather silly thing to do, he reasoned. Of course, it's all rot in a way, it must be. 
but isn't it just as well to treat this sort of thing with some respect? Eventually, he agreed to take the motorboat to within a few hundred yards of the spot. They were to a dinghy in which young Cargill could finish the journey. It took young Cargill half an hour to find a spot, but he did find it, and he did look upon and actually see all that remained of the sunken village. He felt vaguely ashamed of himself when he returned to dry land. He noticed that several of the villagers gave him unfriendly glances, and he resolved that he would say nothing of the matter to the Lardners. They were having tea on the lawn when he dropped in. He thought Mrs. Lardner's welcome was a trifle chilly. After tea, Betty executed a quite deliberate manoeuvre to avoid having him for a partner at tennis. But he ran her to earth later, when they were picking up the balls. How could you? was all she said. I, I, I didn't know you knew, he stammered weakly. Of course everybody knows. It was all over the village before you returned. Can't you see what that legend meant to us? She went on. It was a thing of beauty, and now you've spoiled it. It's like burning down the trees of the fairy glen. You, you goth! But suppose I'm drowned before the year is out, like Roberts, he suggested jocularly. Uh, then I'll forgive you, she said. And to Cargill, it sounded exactly as if she meant what she said. A few days later, he returned to town. For six months, he thought little about the legend. And then he was reminded of it. He'd been spending a weekend at Brighton. On the return journey, he had a first-class smoker in the rear of the train to himself. Towards the end of the hour, he dozed and dreamed of the day he'd looked upon the sunken village. He was awakened when the train made its usual stop on the bridge outside Victoria. It had been a pleasant dream, and he was still trying to preserve the illusion when his eye fell lazily on the window, and he noticed there was a dense fog. A bit rough on the legend that I happen to be a Londoner, he mused. It isn't easy to drown a man in town. He stood up, with the object of removing his dressing case from the rack. But before he reached it, there was the shriek of a whistle, a violent shock, and he was hurled heavily into the opposite seat. It was not a collision in the newspaper sense of the word. No one was hurt. A local train, creeping along at four miles an hour, had simply missed its signal in the fog and bumped the Brighton train. Young Cargill, in common with most other passengers, put his head out of the window. He saw nothing, except the parapet of the bridge. By God, he muttered, if that other train had been going a little faster, he could just hear the river gurgling beneath him. He'd got over his fright by the time he reached Victoria. Just a commonplace accident, he assured himself as he drove in a taxi cab to his chambers. That's the worst of it. If I happened to be drowned in the ordinary way, they'd swear it was the legend. I suppose, for that reason, I'd better not take any risks. Anyhow, I don't need to go near the sea until the year's out. The superstitious would doubtly affirm that the fates had sent him one warning, and, angered at his refusal to accept it, had determined to drive home the lesson of his own impotence. For when he arrived at his chambers, he found a cablegram from Paris awaiting him. Hello, this must be from Uncle Peter, he exclaimed, as he tore open the envelope. Fear Uncle dying, come at once, Machel. Machel was the elder Cargill's secretary, and young Cargill was the old man's heir. It was not until he was in the boat train that he realised he was about to cross the sea. It was a coincidence, an odd coincidence. When the ship tossed in an unusually rough crossing, he was prepared to admit to himself that it was an uncanny coincidence. 
He stayed a week in Paris for the uncle's funeral. When he made the return journey, the channel was like the proverbial mill pond. But it was not until the ship had actually put into Dover that he laughed at the failure of the fates to take the opportunity to drown him. He laughed, to be exact, as he was stepping down the gangway. At the end of the gangway, the fold of the rug which he was carrying in his arm caught in the railings. He turned sharply to free it, and stepping back, cannoned into an officer of the dock. It threw him off his balance on the edge of the dockside. Even if the official had not grabbed him, it is highly probable that he could have saved himself from falling into the water because the gangway railing was within easy reach. And if you remember that he was a champion swimmer, you will agree that it's still more probable that he would not have been drowned, even if he had fallen. But the incident made its impression. His thoughts reverted to it constantly during the next few days. Then he told himself that his attendance at the last rites of his uncle had made him morbid, and was more or less successful in dismissing the affair from his mind. He had many friends in common with the Lardners. Early in February, he was invited for a week's hunting to a house at which Betty Lardner was also a guest. She had not forgotten. She did her best to avoid him and succeeded remarkably well, in spite of the fact that their hostess, knowing something of young Cargill's feelings, made several efforts to throw them together. One day at the end of the hunt, he came alongside of her, and they walked their horses home together. When he was sure they were out of earshot, he asked, You haven't forgiven me yet? You know the conditions, she replied banteringly. You leave me no alternative to suicide, he protested. Oh, that would be cheating, she said. You must be drowned honestly, or it's no good. Then he made a foolish reply. He thought her humour forced, and it annoyed him. Remember that he was exasperated. He had looked forward to meeting her, and now she was treating him with studied coldness over what still seemed to him a comparatively trifling matter. I'm afraid, he said, that it's hardly likely to occur. The fact of my being a townsman instead of a drunken boatman doesn't give your legend a fair chance. Less than an hour afterwards, he was having his bath before dressing for dinner. The water was deliciously hot, and the room was full of steam. As he lay in the bath, a drowsiness stole over him. Enjoying the keen physical pleasure of it, he thought what a wholly delightful thing was a hot bath after a hard day's hunting. His mind, bordering on sleep, dwelt lazily on hot baths in general. And then, with a startling suddenness, came the thought that, before now, men had been drowned in their baths. With a shock, he realised that he had almost fallen asleep. He tried to rouse himself, but a faintness had seized him. That steam! He could not breathe! He was certain he was going to faint. With a desperate effort of the will, he hurled himself out of the bath and threw open the window. It must have been the bath episode that first aroused the sensation of positive fear in Cargill. For it was almost a month later when he surprised the secretary of that swimming club of which he was the main pillar by his refusal to take part in any events for the coming season. He was beginning to take precautions. Late one night, when taxi cabs were scarce, he found that his quickest way to reach home would be by means of one of the tubes. He was in the descending lift when suddenly he remembered that this particular tube ran beneath the river. Suppose an accident should occur, a leakage. After all, such a thing was within the bounds of possibility. Instantly there rose before him the vision of a black torrent roaring through the tunnel. Without waiting for the lift to ascend, he rushed the staircase and, sweating with terror, gained the street and bribed a loafer to find him a cab. He made an effort to take himself seriously in hand after that. More than one acquaintance had lately told him that he was looking very 
nervy. In the last few weeks, his sane and normal self seemed to have shrunk within him. But it was still capable of asserting itself under favourable conditions. It would talk aloud to the rest of him, as if to a separate individual. Oh, look here, old man, this is superstitious nonsense, and it's becoming an obsession to you, it said one fine April morning. Yes, I mean what I say, an obsession. You must pull yourself together, or you'll go stark mad, and then you'll probably go and throw yourself over the embankment. That legend is all bosh. You're in the 20th century, and you're not a drunken fisherman. Hello, young Cargill. The door burst open, and Stranach, oozing health and sanity, glared at him. Joe, what a wreck you look, continued Stranach. You've been frousting too much. I'm glad I came. The car's outside, and we'll run down to Kingston, take a skiff, and pull up to Molesley. The river! Young Cargill felt the blood singing in his ears. Uh, I'm afraid I, I can't manage it. I, I, I've got an appointment this afternoon, he stammered. Stranach perceived that he was lying and wondered. For a few minutes, he gossiped, while young Cargill was repeating to himself, You must pull yourself together, man. It's becoming an obsession. You must pull yourself together. He was vaguely conscious that Stranach was about to depart. Stranach was already in the doorway. His chance of killing the obsession was slipping from him. A special effort, and then, Stop! cried Cargill. I I'll come with you, Stranach. Oddly enough, he felt much better when they were actually on the river. He'd never been afraid of water as such, and the familiar scenery, together with the wholesome exercise of sculling, acted as a tonic to his nerves. They pulled above Molesley Lock, when they were returning, Stranach said, You'll take her through the lock, won't you? It was a needless remark, and if Stranach had not made it, it might have all been well. As a fact, it set Cargill asking himself why he should not take her through the lock. He was admitted to be a much better boatman than Stranach, and everyone knew that it involved a certain amount of skill to manage a lock properly. Locks were dangerous if you played the fool. Before now, People had drowned in locks. The rest was inevitable. He lost his head as the lower gates swung open and broke the rule of the river by pushing out in front of a launch. The launch was already underway and young Cargill, trying to avoid it better, thrust with his boat hook at the side of the lock. The thrust was nervous and ill-calculated and the next instant the skiff had blundered under the bows of the launch happened very quickly. The skiff was forced broadside on against the lock gates and was splintered like firewood. Cargill fell backwards, struck his head heavily against the gates and sank. He returned to consciousness in the lock keeper's lunch. He'd been under water a dangerously long time before Stranach, who'd suffered no more than a wetting, had found him. It had been touch and go for his life but artificial respiration had succeeded. He soon went to pieces after that. From one of the windows of his chambers, the river was just visible. One morning he deliberately pulled the blind down. The action was important. It signified that he had definitely given up pretending that he had the power of shaking off the obsession. But if he could not shake it off, he could at least keep it temporarily at bay. He started a guerrilla action against the obsession with the aid of the brandy bottle. He was rarely drunk and as rarely sober. He was sober on the day he was compelled to call on an aunt who lived in the still prosperous outskirts of Paddington. It was one of his good days and in spite of his sobriety he had himself in very good control when he left his aunt. In his search for a cab, it became necessary for him to cross the canal. On the bridge he paused, and, gripping the parapet, made a surprise attack upon his enemy. Some children playing on the towpath helped him considerably. Their delightful sanity in the presence of the water 
was worth more to him than a brandy. He was positively winning the battle when one of the children fell into the water. For an instant he hesitated, and then, as on the night of the tube episode, panic seized him. The next instant, the man who was probably the best amateur swimmer in England was running with all his might away from the canal. When he reached his chambers, he waited, with the assistance of the brandy, until his man brought him the last edition of the evening paper. A tiny paragraph on the back sheet told him of the tragedy. An hour later, his man found him face downwards on the hearthrug, and wrongly attributing his condition wholly to the brandy, put him to bed. He was in bed about three weeks. The doctor, who was also a personal friend, was shrewd enough to suspect that the brandy was the effect rather than the cause of the trouble. About the first week in June, Cargill was allowed to get up. You've got to go away, said the doctor one morning. You're probably aware that your nerves have gone to pieces. The sea is the place for you. The gasp that followed was scarcely audible, and the doctor missed it. You went to Trinu Walfa about this time last year, continued the doctor. Go there again. Go for long walks in the mountains, and put up at a temperance hotel. He went to Trinu Walfa. The train journey of six hours knocked him up for another week. By the time he was strong enough for the promenade, it was the 14th of June. He noticed the date on the hotel calendar and realised that the fates had another ten days in which to drown him. He did not call on the Lardners. He felt that he couldn't, not after the canal episode. Four of the ten days had passed before Betty Lardner ran across him on the promenade. She noticed at once the change in him, and she was kinder than she had ever been before. Next Saturday, he said, is the anniversary. For answer, she smiled at him, and he might have smiled back had he not remembered the canal. She met him each morning after that, so she was with him on the day when he made his atonement. There had been a violent storm in the early morning. It had driven one of the quarry streamers on the long sandbank that lies submerged between Trinuwalfa and Puffin Island. The gale still lasted, and the steamer was in momentary danger of becoming a complete wreck. There is no lifeboat service at Trinuwalfa. It was impossible to launch an ordinary boat into such seas. Colonel Denby, the owner of the quarry and a local magnate, who had been superintending what feeble efforts had been made to effect a rescue, answered gloomily when Betty Lardner asked him if there were any hope. It's a terrible thing, he jerked. First time there's been a wreck hereabouts, and it's hopeless trying to launch a boat. Suppose a fellow were to swim out to the wreck with a lifeline in tow. It was young Cargill who spoke. The colonel glared at him contemptuously. It'd need to be a pretty fine swimmer, he returned. I don't want to blow my own trumpet, but I am considered to be one of the best amateur swimmers in the country, replied Cargill calmly. If you'll tell your men to get a line ready... I'll borrow a bathing suit from somewhere. They both stared at him in amazement. But you're still an invalid, cried Betty Lardner. You... She stopped short and regarded him with fresh wonder. Somehow he no longer looked an invalid. Mechanically she walked by his side to the little bathing office. Suddenly she clutched his arm. Jack, she said, have you forgotten that... The legend. Betty, he replied, have you forgotten the crew? While he was undressing, the attendant asked him some trivial question. He didn't hear the man. His thoughts were far away. He was thinking of a group of children playing on the bank of a canal. To the accompany of the colonel's protests, they fixed a belt on him, to which was attached a lifeline. He walked along the sloping wooden projection that is used as a landing stage for pleasure skiffs, walked until the water splashed over him, and then he dived into the boiling surf. 
Thus it was that he earned Betty Lardner's forgiveness. End of chapter 6